So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you taking time out of your day to be here. My name is Kayla Rogers, and I am the program supervisor for the Women's Fund. For those of you who are not familiar with our organization, we are a nonprofit located in Houston, Texas, and our mission is to provide women and girls with the tools that they need to be advocates for their health. So we do this through focused seminars like today's presentation, as well as curriculum-based classes and publications. If you're interested in learning more about the Women's Fund, please visit our website, thewomensfund.org, where you can sign up for classes like we host today, as well as download free versions of our publications or request physical copies. Before we get started, I do wanna ask that throughout the presentation, you remain on mute just so we can limit any distractions. There will be an opportunity at the end of the presentation for you to ask any questions that you have. Um, but throughout the presentation, if you don't wanna forget what your question is, you can always add it into the chat. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our speaker today. Um, We're lucky to have Caroline Pasisis join us and give our presentation over handling emergencies. Caroline is a certified physician assistant in the internal medicine department at Kelsey Siebold's River Oaks Clinic. She received her Bachelor of Science in Nutrition at the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa, Tuscaloosa excuse me, in 2016, and her Master of Physician Assistant Studies in 2019 at Bethel University in Paris, Tennessee. Following graduation, she cared for patients as a family medicine physician assistant at Texas Health Physicians Group, the Texas Health Family Care in Willow Park. She joined the Kelsey Siebel Internal Medicine Department in 2021. Caroline is a member of the American Academy of Physician Assistants, Texas Academy of Physician Assistants, and Texas Gulf Coast Physician Assistant Association. She enjoys practicing yoga, going for walks outdoors, spending time with family and friends, and gardening. So let's go ahead and turn the floor open. over. Um, Caroline, thank you so much for joining us. Okay, thank you so much for that introduction. Like she said, I'm Caroline. I go by Caroline. My first name is Anastasia, um, and I'm a physician assistant with Kelsey Siebold. I'm honored to be giving this presentation today for the Women's Fund. I think this is a wonderful organization. Just thrilled to be here. So we'll get started. This is handling emergencies, when to call 911, but also what to do in even kind of more urgent um, situations. So 10 most common accidents in the home, falling objects, trips and falls, bruises, sprains, cuts, burns, choking, poisoning, glass re related injuries, and drowning. Okay, so these are all the things that we're gonna go over today one by one and get a little bit more detail about that. So falling objects. I think this is important to talk about for both children and adults. Um, I like to think about, think about your shelves. What do you have on those highest shelves? Is, is it something soft or is it something heavy and um, hard? So for instance, in my um, pantry, I try to make sure to keep kind of the heavier appliances or jugs of water on the bottom and then extra paper towels, napkins up top. So if you reach for something and that falls, it's soft, it's gonna hit you. So that's something to think about when you're organizing your home and just um, kind of being aware of your surroundings in that matter. If you are reaching for something, looking up first, um, because that certainly could cause injury um, very easily if it's something heavy or hard or sharp. Trips and falls. Um, so anybody can trip or fall, it's more common in young people as well as elders, but really anybody this could happen to. Um, so safety devices, again, this is for certain populations, those um, elders, or if you have a, a known condition, trouble with balance, having um, rails in your, in your bathtub or your shower to hold on to, because that's certainly an area that would be more slippery than usual. Um, and then I think this is a big one, thinking about at your home, um, the type of flooring you install or have. Some people these days in bathrooms use certain tiles in their floors that are quite slippery. And so if, you're, if you have that there and you can't change the tile, getting rugs that are sturdy um, 
or if you're choosing to, um, flooring to choose ones that seem more sturdy. And then you can, you can do what you can with your home, but then also being aware when you're in other people's homes or public places, just kind of being aware when you walk in. I think this will be a trend you see throughout this presentation. It's a lot of just being aware of your surroundings. Um, so that's something to think about um, to prevent trips or falls, going up and down stairs, knowing, okay, here's railing, I have it here, I'm ready. Um, and that's the thing with kids, they don't you know, think maybe so much to hold the railing. So if, if, you, if you know there's a child around, be aware of your surroundings, are there stairs around? Is, is there stairs behind that door that I need to be prepared for? Things like that. Um, and then keeping floors clean, um, again, especially for those who already have trouble balancing, elders, kids in a walkway, is there something, an uh, object in the ground that they may not see at eye level that they could trip over? Um, so if someone does fall, most minor falls, um, can only hurt your pride, but um, they can also result in serious injury. So if seek help, if um, someone becomes, certainly if they fall, um, if they hit their head or lose consciousness, if they become drowsy, they notice limited movement in any of areas that they fall onto, or you suspect a broken bone, it never hurts to ask. It never hurts to come and see us if you're unsure at all. The best answer is you're, you're doing fine. There's nothing wrong. So um, it, it never hurts to check if you have any concerns after a fall. Bruises. So what is a bruise? It's an injury that causes the blood to, to leak into the skin where you can see it. Um, anything that causes trauma to the superficial skin can cause a bruise. Um, in general, treating them, just monitoring, you can reduce if there's a little bit of swelling um, using ice. Now, in any occasion where you use ice, I always tell um, people to not put ice directly in the skin, especially on extremities, you can cause cold injury. So having some form of, whether it's a you know, paper towel or a cloth between the ice and your direct skin, whenever you're icing something, um, but using ice on a bruise um, to help with swelling and pain. Um, but um, things to look out for in, in, in this scenario, if you notice everybody bruises, you know, as we age, our skin gets thinner and it's a little bit easier to bruise. But if you're bruising all of the time on the most light touch, um, or if you get a bruise and you're having significant pain or continued pain, or if it's not seeming to improve, um, seek medical care and evaluation for that. I think that's kind of the biggest takeaway um, from that or restricted movement. Um, so if you get a bruise and you notice around the area of the bruise, you're, you're not able to move that that joint um, very well. That's something there could be something more deep going on. Sprains. Um, so what is a sprain? A sprain is an injury to a ligament um, which attaches bones or joints together. Um, and so that can be caused by any sort of um, unexplained force that stretches it or minor tears to the um, ligament. Um, how to treat these, as with bruises, cold, so icing it, again, not direct ice, but um, icing the area to help with swelling. Um, and um, I think always, if you're not sure, I think this is a good one. It's hard to differentiate how um, severe the sprain is. Is it a sprain? Is it a strain, which I'll talk about? That's a good one always to come be seen. If, if you um, notice a sudden pain after a certain movement or you wake up with any swelling in a joint or area, always, always see someone just to check. Um, and the difference between a sprain and a strain, a strain is a muscle, usually a muscle or a tendon which attaches the muscle to the bone. So that's a difference. You think about muscle strain, like um, a lot of times people get muscle strain in their shoulders after um, poor posture at work, things like that. That's a, a strain of a muscle or pulled back. That's usually a strain of a muscle. A sprain is a ligament. Um, the most common sprains we see, I would say are ankles, but ankles, knees, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, ankles, knees, and wrists are the most common. Um, so that's kind of that on sprains. Um, the last thing actually I would say, I talked about swelling. If you notice any swelling, I would seek help. And then inability to bear weight or just significant pain, bearing weight, bearing weight means stepping on the area. Um, or limited movement that you're you're not able to move it without significant pain. Cuts. Um, so we think about in the kitchen knives. Um, this is a this is an important thing to talk about. It's actually dull knives are more dangerous because um, we have to put more force. Things can get wobbly. 
Um, so keeping our knives sharp is actually um, something safe to do. And then um, when you're using a knife, you're typically using a cutting board. You should be. And a good rule of thumb is make sure the knife is within the, the diameter, within the parameter of the cutting board. If you notice you're looking at your cutting board and your knife is not there, where is it? Is it in your hand? Is it somewhere else that you know could be um, more hazardous that you're you don't know, realize? So I think that's a really good rule of thumb. Always make sure your knife is within the parameter of your cutting board um, and that it's sharp, and that's a good a good safety tip there. Um, how to treat cuts, apply pressure. Anytime you get a cut, apply pressure immediately to help stop the bleeding. Um, clean the area with um, gentle soap and water. Um, if, if the bleeding stops following pressure, that's likely meaning it, it doesn't require stitches, but that, um, again, if you're ever unsure, always be seen. Um, if you notice that you're applying pressure for more than 10 to 15 minutes and the bleeding doesn't stop or if it's deep. Um, and avoiding cuts, we kind of talked about that, keeping the knife sharp, only using them around the cutting board, storing this knife securely. So sometimes we get busy and we're putting our dishes away and we kind of keep our, our drawers cluttered to making sure you have a specific area where knives go and they only go there. Um, and then seeking help. Um, number one, signs of infection. If you know the bleeding stops and you think it's okay, you don't need stitches, you think then um, after the fact, the pain should never be worse than it was at the time of the cut. So if you notice the pain is worse the next day, or you see more swelling or redness, streaking redness, those are signs of infection, oozing, um, that's a reason to be seen immediately. Um, or again, if the bleeding doesn't stop after pressure, it depends on the bleed, how, how long a time of pressure, but I would say if it doesn't stop after 15 minutes, I would, I would be seen just to be safe. Um, so that's about that, about cuts. Burns. Um, so how do burns happen? It can be drinks, fires, cookers, iron, hair styling products. I know I've done that before with my curling iron. Um, matches, hot matches that aren't cooled down yet. Um, and so defining burns, there's several different degrees of burns. First degree, it's just meaning just the top layer of your skin. It's superficial, it's red, it's painful. Second degree, superficial red, painful, but a little bit deep into what we call the dermis, which is the second layer of the skin. Um, and then you see a little bit more swelling. Um, sometimes it'll be shiny. Um, and that's kind of how you see that second degree. Anything more than that, if you see white, if you see black, um, if it's not painful, seek immediate care, or if it's more than about three inches. Um, so size matters to the, the area of the burn. Um, so definitely like palm of your hand, bigger than that, but even a little bit, three inches, measure and find something that you can remember that's about three inches and that's a rule of thumb. Um, and then anything, if you're just not sure, is this second degree, is it first, is it third, you're just not sure, come see us. But in the meantime, run it under, immediately run it under cold water for about 10 minutes and then you can apply an by appointment um, and then you know, schedule an appointment or be seen immediately that day if you think that's necessary. Um, choking. So this is the next thing. Choking, again, can occur at any age. Um, for adults, it's a lot more times food, um, whereas kids, they could swallow an object that they think is food, but it's not. Um, and the, what happens with choking is, it, you know, it's blocking your windpipe or your esophagus and not allowing um, flow of air to go in and out. Um, so the Heimlich maneuver I'm thinking about fives. It's five um, kind of strong taps between the two shoulder blades um, on the back, and then um, five thrusts, abdominal thrusts. So you take one fist and then the hand like this, and right um, above your belly button. Think about above your belly button, and then thrust kind of up, um, in and up five times, and then you go back and forth between that until you see, you physically see an object that comes out. Um, if that's not working, um, call 911 immediately. Or um, even after it, um, after the choking is done, you see the object come out. If you're having difficulty breathing, if you're feeling drowsy, confused, um, drooling, trouble breathing, anything like that, abnormal pain, um, seek immediate care. Um, and then identify choking in someone other than yourself. If they seem like they're talking differently, if their breathing sounds odd in any way, um, 
if they're trying to cough, but they can't, or you know, they didn't have a cough before, and all of a sudden they have this strong cough. Or of course, if they their their skin or their lips appear blue, call nine one immediately and start the highlight maneuver, or start the highlight maneuver and shout for help for someone else to call nine one one. Poisoning. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that someone can be poisoned. It could be inhaling something, touching something, injecting something, or even um, a gas. Um, so I would say if you if you think that you yourself or someone has been poisoned, um, if if yourself or someone seems drowsy, if they're of course unconscious, so they seem abnormally agitated, uncontrolled, shaking your movements, call nine one immediately. I would say call 911 first if they seem unstable and then call poison control. It's great to put this number in your phone. Um, it's 800-222-1222. And so if someone seems stable, but you're not sure if, if you or someone took too many of, uh, of a pill or something, or unsure if you've been poisoned, you, could, you feel fine or the person feels fine, call poison control and they'll walk you through what to do. Um, but that's only if the, you or the person is stable, if not, 911 first and call poison control. Um, and just um, symptoms of poisoning, it can, can mimic other conditions. So again, if you're feeling um, if this one seems intoxicated, um, if someone feels drowsy or really agitated or moving oddly. Um, and then just again, um, theme of this presentation, being aware of your surroundings. If you see a pill bottle, if you walk in and someone seems altered and you see a pill bottle, um, or you smell a gas, or you see a spill. Um, and I would caution, like, immediately going to clean things up before you call poison control. I wouldn't, I would, if it's a gas area, a gaseous um, substance, I would remove yourself and the person out of the, air, out of the area as far as possible and call poison control. I know this, it says wear gloves um, and um, wash immediately. So if a person is, has something on them, then get them in a shower and wash immediately and then remove yourself from the area. Wait for poison control to tell you how to put gloves on and clean it before, I would say, um, before doing anything that matters, if that makes sense. Okay, glass related injuries. This kind of goes similar with the cuts, um, but broken glass specifically, um, you know, because that's not an expected sharp object, whereas knife, you know, this is sharp and broken glass can happen immediately and you're not prepared. Um, and so it can cause all kinds of cuts and wounds. Um, what to do, same thing with the cuts, put pressure on the area immediately, clean with gentle soap and water. Um, you can, if it's small and you think you can cover it with antibiotic ointment um, and the bleeding has stopped, that would be something to do. And then you can always follow up with your primary care provider after that. But again, if the bleeding doesn't stop, if it's a more than um, half an inch long, or if it seems really deep or wide, call 911 or seek immediate care. Um, I think that's kind of the main takeaway from that. And then, well, cleaning, um, sweep the area, but then, you know, there's always tiny little pieces. So this is a good tip. If you have bread at your house, uh, wear gloves, thick gloves. If, if you don't have thick gloves, even like ski gloves or something like that, and then take the, um, piece of bread and kind of tap the area and the bread can pick up the tiny little pieces that you might not get from your broom. Um, so just something to think about and make sure with all pets and children's from children from that room until you make you're very confident that there's not anything um, left. Drowning. Um, so again this can happen to anybody at all ages. We see it more in young younger children, um, even even in very shallow water. Pools are a common danger. Um, so drowning can cause more than 30% of all accidental deaths in children um, age one to four and most commonly happen in swimming pools. So never leave a child unattended at a swimming pool. But I think outside of swimming pools, it's also important to think about, um, you know, if you're at an area, let's say you run a bath and there's a child in the house, you know, make sure you're not walking right from the bathtub. Or if you're at an area, even if it's a shallow little small, you know, fish pond or of course a big lake or area of water. So always, again, be aware of your surroundings, you walk into an area, is there kids, is there a body of water? And kind of think about that. Um, if you see someone like this, if they're drowning, of course, jump in, pull them out of the water, check for pulse. If you check your neck here, there's a pretty easy to feel pulse or on your wrist, if you're not aware of that. And then breathing, so as their chest rising and falling. Um, and then begin CPR, 
if you know how to shout for help. Um, if you're doing CPR, shout for help. Someone call 911. If not, you can call 911 um, immediately once you get them out of the water. So, general emergency preparedness: um, keeping your phone and your wallet with you at all times, and knowing your allergies, your current medications, your medical history. There's two things that I would recommend in this regard um, for phone and wallet. Um, having like some sort of little um, piece of paper or card um, that has this information, your allergies, your medications, your medical history, you want to um, add your, your age, your date of birth, your height and weight, um, and then several, I would even write several emergency contacts, their numbers and names on that card. If you could do front and back and put that in your wallet, I would, I would do that. And then um, there's something really cool on, I know for sure iPhones, I'm sure Androids have a similar, but the iPhone has a help app and you can create a, um, a, it's a medical ID. And so you kind of put all that information I just said, whatever you would like to, you leave out what you don't want to add, but um, you put your allergies, your current medications, your medical history, your height and weight, and then one or numerous um, emergency contacts and so I'll show you, I, I brought my phone up here. Um, you take your cell phone and you press the lock button. Um, and so someone, the reason I say to have the card too, the red card is because someone would have to be tech savvy to know to pull your phone out and do this. So I think it's good to have both um, and, and whoever comes will, will try both. Um, and so you hold your lock button in like the upper volume button for a few seconds. And you'll see that's how, if you know, that's how you turn your cell phone off if you want to power off. But also you'll see, it'll say medical ID. Once you set it up, it takes just a few minutes to set up medical ID on the um, Apple app, it's free. Um, and if, if someone came and grabbed my phone and did this, if they slide that, they will see all that information. They won't see anything that would be my phone locked, but they wouldn't have to unlock my phone to see that information. They can immediately click and call, um, any of my emergency contacts if they need to know okay, what medications are they on, what kind of medical conditions are they diabetic, do we need to check their blood sugar, that kind of things. Um, and then also of note, um, underneath that, the SOS, if you do the same little thing, if you were ever in an emergency, whether it be a medical emergency or you're in danger, you can slide and that, uh, if you slide that, it immediately calls 911. You don't have to click anything, you just slide and it's ringing 911. Um, so that's just a little tip there. And then, of course, choosing who you want your set one. I would take several um, emergency contacts in case one, you know, is not by their phone um, to have on hand. And so, in summary, trust your gut. Um, be aware of your surroundings. Whenever you walk into a new place, um, just kind of think about some things. Um, and then call 911 if you ever have any concerns or if it's urgent, but maybe not emergent, you can always see a medical provider, even if you think it probably is nothing, but you're not for sure, always seek medical care. Um, and then for Kelsey, we have a 24 hour nurse hotline, um, which I think is a great resource. Now, if you think you're in immediate um, distress or someone is in immediate distress, call 911 first. But if you think it's urgent, but you're just not sure uh, what to do, you can call our 24-hour uh, nurse hotline, 713-442-0000. They'll could connect you to the 24-hour um, nurse. The nurse has certain things that they can provide you um, as far as recommendations or if they think they need to call the on-call physician. We always have an on-call physician. They can do that, um, and then they'll call you. Um, so I think that's a really good resource, resource again, for urgent things. If it's emergent, call 911. Um, and along that line, the same number, the 713-442-0000 is how you get in touch with Kelsey. That's our general number. They can refer you to um, appointments, anything that you think you might need. And then kelsey-siebel.com. I think that's a really great resource um, for all information with Kelsey Siebel. You can look up all the providers have pictures, even videos, bios. If you're looking for a new provider um, and all kinds of resources, kelsey-siebel.com. So that's just some information about us. That kind of concludes the presentation. So um, now we'll have time, hopefully, for questions. Um, thank you so much. Yes, so we're gonna go ahead and open the floor for questions. If you would like, you can place them in our chat. 
or if you're more comfortable with unmuting yourself to ask your question, you can definitely do that as well. Um, I will go ahead and kick off with the first question. So you covered the 10 most common accidents in the home. Would you say that the top three differ between adults and children? And if so, what would you say are probably more common in children and more common in adults? Okay, I do think they differ, I do. I would say just off the top of my head, I do not know the statistics to confirm this, I will say that. But I would say for adults, I would think um, falling or tripping um, would be one of the top ones. Um, Gosh, it's hard. Falling objects, I think, is a big one just because we're busy and we're reaching for things. And then cuts to just accidental cuts. We love, everybody loves to cook at home, especially these days, staying home. And so I think that's probably one of the biggest ones. Um, and then for kids, I think choking easily, choking, um, drowning. And I would say between falling objects, Poisoning, I think, for really little kids who just don't know, you know, they're not able to communicate yet. I think that would be the bigger one. So it maybe depends on the, the children age group, but I think that's a big one. But I think choking and drowning, I would say top two. Um, and the kids' brain, they're just playing around, and I think that happens a lot with kids as well. That's just off the top of my head. Thank you. Any questions in the chat? Um, I had a question. Uh, so we talked about various injuries that one can get. How do we know when to like reach out to our PCP or go to an urgent care versus an emergency room? Like what do the injuries look like? How to choose, should I go to PCP? Yeah. Should I go to urgent care? Should I go to an emergency room? Yes. The number, number one thing I would say is just office hours. So because most primary care offices are only open eight to five, I think that's the big thing. Um, most of the time when you're unsure about urgent care at ER, most urgent cares will confidently tell you, like if you walk in, and they take a look at you and they say, you need to go to the emergency room, they'll send you. Um, so if you're unsure, I mean, you can feel pretty confident. They'll, they'll refer you if they think. And same thing with primary care. If you call, I would say, you know, there's a lot of um, like my chart type things now. If it's something emergent, always call and then send a message to your primary care provider because it may take them a day or two to respond. Um, urgent cares can do small stitching and things like that. So, <laughs> It's hard to say, it's so case by case basis, um, but a lot of the, the emergent things we talked about today would be not, would be ER. Um, but smaller cuts, primary care, urgent care during office hours, certainly um, you could be seen. Um, trying to think of other uh, small burns. Um, again, if it's, if it's first degree or even second degree in it, but it's under three inches, definitely primary care. Um, if, you, if you fell, we see a lot of that in, in primary care um, because it's just you're unsure if this is, you know, you know, if someone can't get off the ground, that's usually uh, 911. But if you're able to get up, but you're just having some pain, sprains, we see a lot in primary care. Um, I think those would be the main things. I would say sprains, small burns, falls, bruising. That's usually not quite urgent. Yeah, and in chat said, this isn't really a question, more of a comment, but thank you for the bright recommendation to pick up glass. That happened to me last week when a bunch of small glass was everywhere when I accidentally broke the jar. Now I know. Yes, you're very welcome. That's that's a great tip I learned recently too, so it's very helpful. So, and there are also uh, any other tips like those? As far as when you're um, picking up glass? Glass or other injuries that are common tips that we can use. I think for the glass, like as far as wearing a glove, you know, go find some ski gloves or winter gloves that are thick um, when you're handling glass. Um, that would be one tip. The other kind of gen just um, generally, I think my biggest tip would just be always being aware of your surroundings. It's probably my biggest takeaway from today. So I had a question. Um, you mentioned for burns because I feel like I get burned all the time yeah. cooking, yeah. even though it's obviously very minor. Um, I, I heard this, I don't know if it's true, but like putting toothpaste on like a burn, I know that's mm -hmm. a common trick that people have told me, but I was like, let me just ask, let's see if this is actually accurate. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend that. I think for several reasons, one, the toothpaste could be uh, not super clean, you know, it's been in your bathroom, 
and uh, that's really not an evidence-based practice. So it just, you know, who, there are so many different types of toothpaste out there. It doesn't have known antimicrobial product. It could cause, it could make it worse. So I would probably stay away from toothpaste. Okay. Do you know what any of like, I know there's a lot of people want to use natural remedies mm -hmm. to kind of lessen pain. Yeah. Do you know any that work? I think the ice is based. Ice is a big thing. Like a bag of peas is great. I love a bag of vegetables, you know, even over big ice, because that's kind of harder. I think a bag of peas or vegetables is a really good thing. Um, and just kind of holding that. Usually I do like 10 to 15 minutes a couple of times a day and then running the cold water. And I mean, they say 10 minutes. So holding that burn under the cold water for a full 10 minutes may not actually make a difference over the next few days for you if you do that immediately. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Um, so kind of going off the questions that they had, what would you suggest that people kind of keep on hand for their home like first aid kit? Okay. So definitely some over-the-counter triple antibiotic ointment, even the you know generic brand, it doesn't even have to be the Neosporin. Um, so some triple antibiotic ointment, um, band-aids, gloves, um, but again, if you're concerned about a uh, chemical, I would call poison control before you just start touching it with, with any gloves. Um, we were talking earlier, if you can, having things to check vitals, especially with virtual medicine now, having a blood pressure cup, having something to check your pulse or even oxygen levels. Um, but now you don't have time to do all that if it's something emergent, I wouldn't worry about that. Um, but I think usually there's a lot of first aid kits. They'll have like alcohol wipes. Um, they'll have, but gentle soap and water typically for a cut is fine. That's, that's perfectly fine for a cut. Um, but it'll have alcohol wipes. It'll have band-aids. It'll have, if you're not sure, like, you know, you may have a cut and you don't want to put a dirty kitchen towel. So a lot of those um, kits will have like what we call like two by twos or four by four little the gauze. gauze. Yeah. So that, you know, is clean. Um, so that's a good one, um, I think. And then bags of vegetables. <laughs> I really think that's a good inexpensive thing to have around. Okay. So um, another question that I have is, um, you mentioned different situations in which icing something may help. Mm -hmm. When would you use heat? So always good to talk to your primary care doctor if you have some pain. Um, ice helps with inflammation and swelling. Heat helps um, with pain, I think, more um, and help with circulation. Heat will help with circulation. So I would say um, strains, muscle strains. So like if you just have been having bad posture at work, um, sometimes you can, all, I usually will alternate ice or heat. Um, but if it's swollen, it's a new injury, I would talk to your your provider before you use direct heat. And you never, um, I think this is a good thing, it's not on the, um, on the power point, but you never, if you use a heating pad, you never wanna put it directly on your skin and you never want to fall asleep. If you feel sleepy and you're just relaxing, you think there's even a chance, go ahead and unplug it. You never wanna fall asleep with a, on a heating mat, heating pad or with one on. Yeah. Um, now that we are getting into the summer months and Texas heat is ridiculous, um, what recommendations would you have to help with preventing heat exhaustion or heat stroke? And then what signs would you tell people to kind of look for that would indicate someone is heat? Yeah. Um, I think you definitely have to just um, automatically increase your daily fluid intake because what our daily fluid intake is, there's not a kind of a one answer for that. It depends on your exercise level, your metabolism. Um, you, a general rule of thumb is if your urine is kind of a white, white, yellow, close to um, close to clear, you know you're well hydrated. If it's not, that tells your body whatever you're doing is not enough. If you drink caffeine, that can make you more dehydrated. So kind of there's a lot of things that. So I can't tell you exactly how many bottles of water to drink a day, but I think um, whatever you you were doing. A couple months ago, you probably need to increase it now that it's summer because you're out, you're going to be releasing more um, more fluid. Um, so that's the number one thing. It's just you know when you first wake up, 
have a glass of water between at before each meal. You need to try to find little ways to add water. Um, I think a good thing, hydration, like you can get a lot of hydration with the fruit, like melons, things like that. Um, adding those is non-water ways to get your hydration. Um, so that's a big thing. And then kind of looking at your day, how long are you going to be outside for? Are you prepared? Did you pack a water? Did you um, wear appropriate sun gear? And that's I know, another kind of another topic, but um, are you going to have, you're going to go to this place. Is there somewhere inside where you go when you start feeling hot or is there not somewhere? Be prepared. Um, and then signs and symptoms, um, they can vary. There's a lot of different symptoms. Just feeling generally fatigued, dizzy, um, unexplained sweating, headaches. Certainly if someone is feeling confused, that would be more emergent. But if you're just generally feeling um, lightheaded, dizzy, fatigued, and headaches or shaky, that would be some, some big signs. Nausea, vomiting. That would be severe. Kind of, sorry. Um, this is regarding just, it's not necessarily an emergency, but, but it's more so like women's health. Um, I know you mentioned heating pads and stuff like that. And when women are on their menstrual cycle and girls, I've done this before. I put it on my like stomach because mm -hmm. I know that like it just helps it just soothes my pain mm -hmm. but is there a time where it's just like there should be if there's a time limit like you shouldn't exceed it because i know like i have fallen asleep with one on um I, it's just like comfortable and it yeah. does like it does soothe that pain yeah so. i don't know an exact time limit but i would say yeah, after 15 and 20 minutes i would take a break Probably. yeah okay. and then you can go back to it but take a break okay. and remember always have t-shirt or something between you and the heating pad um you know you can buy there are some of those some of those heating things that you buy and you can put in the microwave so i think that's a really good thing because then you don't have to worry about it it's hot for until it just cools out on its own whereas the heating pad that has to be plugged in you have to be conscious of so you know like the, the socks you put rice and things like that um i don't know the exact so be careful with that that could be you know fire hazard but there are certain things you can buy that you can heat up in the microwave um, that just is hot temporarily and then it cools out on its own. So maybe look into that and you don't have to worry and you can just relax. Yeah, thank yeah. you. But that I would still not put the under skin because oh, it could be, still be warm. And for anyone who wanted to contact the number, the 713442 number, like, um, is it open to the general public? Is it, is there anything? It is, it is if you're inquiring about becoming a patient with Kelsey. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I think the 24-hour hotline, they would have to be able to look at your chart to get more information. I think you would have to be a, um, a, a patient for them to be able to safely give you recommendations. But if you ha are not a patient yet and you call, we have um, after-hour like video visits. So you could become a new patient that night if you wanted to. Um, you know, I believe that I, I would confirm with that, but I believe, I mean, if you're not a patient yet, you can always call that number, certainly during office hours to inquire about the patient. Any other questions in the chat? Thank you so much. I really um, enjoyed this and honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline, so much for giving us this presentation. I think that this time of year, it's really helpful to have this information, especially now with summer starting and we may be around the home a lot more often. Um, so just kind of knowing what to do and how to immediately address these situations is extremely helpful. We will have a recording of this presentation posted to our YouTube channel within a week. Um, I will be sending that out in the follow-up email. So if you know of someone who may benefit from watching this presentation, I highly encourage that you share that information with them. And then take an opportunity to look at some of our previous recordings as we've done a lot of really great presentations, um, especially with our presenters from Kelsey. So thank you so much.
Um, if you have questions or comments after the presentation, I know I tend to walk away and have questions after the fact, you can always email the Women's Fund at healtheducator at thewomensfund.org and we will go ahead and respond with an answer to your question or work to get an answer to your question. I will also be sharing the survey link in the follow-up email. We would really appreciate if you would take a few moments to provide us with some feedback. Let us know what you liked, what things we could improve, and then different topics that you are interested in. And then finally, I highly encourage that you visit our website, thewomensfund.org, and our social media. Um, you can find us by looking up the Women's Fund or the Women's Fund Houston on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Um, we live stream a lot of our presentations to Facebook, and then we also post regularly about upcoming events and things that we have going on in the organization. So I highly encourage that you visit our websites and follow us on social media. Other than that, that concludes our presentation for today. Um, but I do want to do one final plug, um, if I can, for our House My Health present, uh, publication. So this is a great resource where you can keep up with any doctor's appointments, medications, vaccines, your medical history. Um, so as Caroline mentioned, having that information written down somewhere is really important. And I think that this book could be a great tool for you um, and other people in your life. So thank you again so much for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it and we hope to see you next time. Bye. Yeah. 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 Yeah.